okay can everybody hear me can everybody hear me okay i just want to make sure okay we're good okay so the title of my project yes. uh, sterilization and sanitizing of 3d printed n95 like face masks um so in the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020 uh there were word there was word coming out that there was going to be a massive ppe shortage all over the country and so a local company in Joplin called Nemotech 3D Printing, uh, this guy, Daniel Hawkins right here, had the idea to um, use their 3D printing equipment to make uh, N95 masks. And I still have mine right here. And they're uh, N95-like face masks printed with a single wall polypropylene design. And so here's just a little bit of a video from uh, Nemotech that will give you just a, a little bit of the basics of the mask. Also, just uh, the volume might be loud. I don't know how loud it'll be coming through, so just a warning. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so this is Daniel Hawkins. He's the designer of the, the Sani mask, as he called it. Um, he printed an airtight mask according to N95 sizes, which we all know is important because it forms a seal along the face right here. And uh, they're printed according to, you know, if you get size for an N95 mask at a hospital or at your workplace. Um, it's made out of this reusable polypropylene material. And what was most important about the mask, I think, as we all know, after a year of wearing masks, is this replaceable filter. Obviously, you need to pick a material that is effective in filtering uh, respiratory droplets. And Daniel decided to use shop towels, which was just something I think he, he found in maybe his shop garage and something that's commonly owned by you know quite a few people. Um, so specifically, this mask uh, seals to your face. And then this polypropylene ring hold, uh, does two jobs. It'll hold the, the filtering material on the opening of the mask, but then it also secures the mask to your face. Uh, so starting off, we use the CDC standard cleaning method of 91% isopropanol. And I see my typo right there, so try not to focus on that. Um, a commonly used plastic in uh, 3D printing is this PLA material. And so we started off by just throwing, uh, they had a PLA cylinder that they wanted us to test just to see um, what kind of bacteria grew in it. And so we sanitized the cylinders with 91% isopropanol and then uh, cultured the bacteria 24. We uh, actually quantified the, the amount of bacterial growth 24 hours and 72 hours post sanitization. 
pre-sanitization and post-sanitization. So it showed that this PLA material wasn't going to be an effective material for this mask. And you can see here on the gram stain, we have gram positive cocci and then some gram negative uh, rods. So moving forward with this, we tested a couple different plastics. Uh, here's the, the PLA that was the blue cylinder on the previous slide, another one called TPU, and then our uh, material of choice, which was the polypropylene. And so here's a few of our, our different cleaning methods, and I can walk through this here shortly, but um, in our 24 hours post sanitization, we had a, a bleach and peroxide group here. So over here we had, we rinsed with bleach for 20 minutes. Actually, let me go back. What we did was we took these plastic squares and inoculated them with uh, E. coli and cultured them overnight. And then we did these cleaning methods over here, which I can walk through in the next slide. But 24 hours post sanitization, we have the growth mark and then 72 hours. And obviously the isopropanol didn't effectively clean the PLA or TPU, but it did effectively clean the uh, polypropylene material we were using. And so moving forward, we were uh, concerned with, you know, if your hospital bought a bunch of these masks and worst case scenario, these were the ones that you had to use, would people be able to take these masks home and clean them with just, you know, household cleaning products? So we picked a few that we think that, you know, most people would have at home. We have hydrogen peroxide, uh, I think it's 3% bleach, Dawn dish soap, and then this last one is, they're called sani wipes. They're used commonly to uh, disinfect surfaces, beds, tables in uh, hospital spaces, and they have a cleaning. Um, what is what the word I'm looking for? Anyway, there's a cleaning solution in them that's made with benzalkonium chloride, and it's not on this one. But moving forward, um, so this is the same graph that's on this previous slide. I can just use this to walk you through it. So we started off with uh, one centimeter by one centimeter squares of the polypropylene material. We inoculated them with uh, E. coli and then grew them overnight in uh, LB broth. And then the next day we performed uh, a variety of cleaning methods, which turned out to be kind of overkill, but, it, but it's okay. Um, so our 24 hour sanitization methods, we have our benzalkonium chloride, which we wiped down the, the polypropylene for five minutes. And then we baked them in a 70 degree Celsius oven for 24 hours. Um, the next 24 hour cleaning method was a rinse in 3% hydrogen peroxide for 24 hours. And then our third cleaning method was just um, rinsing the uh, polypropylene square in 3% hydrogen peroxide and then baking it at 70 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. So 70 C, 70 C is like 300 degrees. So if you had, you know, a temperature that you can reach in like your home oven. Um, in our 48 hour sanitization uh, methods, same thing, one centimeter polypropylene squares inoculated with E. coli overnight. We had um, our Dawn dish soap uh, and then rinsed with water for 20 minutes and then baked for 48 hours at 70 C. We had our Sani wipe, the benzalkonium chloride again, uh, cleaned for five minutes and then baked at 70 C for 48 hours. And then just to test it out, uh, we did just a rinse in deionized water and then baked the plastic at um, 70 C for 48 hours. And then here we used autoclave as a negative control, which I think was surprising because the uh, polypropylene actually survived the autoclave. But um, as you can see in all of our sanitization methods, 24 hours and 72 hours post um, sanitization, there wasn't a significant amount of bacterial growth in any of the cleaning groups. And so moving forward, we took the entire mask and thought to ourselves, okay, bare minimum, if nobody had an oven at home and they just had bleach or bleach and peroxide. Um, we inoculated the entire mask and I think it was like 1500 milliliter beakers. We uh, grew the bacteria overnight, or excuse me, we grew the mask and bacteria overnight. Um, did our bleach for 20 minutes and peroxide for 20 minutes method and then rinse with water and then cultured 24 and 72 hours afterwards. So you can see that the bleach and peroxide method effectively clean the masks. And then we did bleach alone, which was the last clip in Daniel's video in the beginning. Uh, so rinsing the mask in bleach for 20 minutes post inoculation and then rinsing with water. And you can show that it, um, the mask was effectively clean 24 hours and 72 hours post sanitization. So really quickly, I wanna say thank you to KCU for giving me another opportunity to do a research fellowship. Uh, thank you to Dr. Stottinger for allowing me to 
buggy to death in your lab and for teaching me as much as you could along the way. Um, and then I want to say thank you to the, the student doctors who are all listed on the on my poster. If you go click through the poster sections, uh, my, I don't remember what number mine is, but uh, for helping me uh, work on writing the paper, editing uh, the graphics and stuff. And yeah, I can open up for questions now. Dr. Agbas. Uh, hi, Karsten. It's a cool project. I liked it, but I have a quick question. One of them is that so this frame is plastic and then sterilizable, but the 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 sheet that you put on the uh, on the on the, um, on the on the frame is that this possible? Am I correct? Yeah, and so okay. uh, you can switch it out between uses, and okay. then you know. Okay, it, it, is this the what is the pore size of that uh, the you know the dispensable the sheet as compared to the double layer fabrics that what we are using? That's actually a good question. That wasn't something that we focused on in uh, the design of the mask. Obviously, that would be something that Nemotech would have to come up with in terms of you know what was going to be the filter material. But you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, it, uh, the CDC was recommending wearing something like a, a scarf over your mouth or cutting you know nice. the sleeves out of a T-shirt and layering, you know, doubling them up like that. So worst case scenario, if that was all you had, you know, at least the mask would seal to your face and then it would filter you know based on your material. But but that's a good point. Is the, just, the just, follow, is just follow up mini question is that okay that was the time that we didn't have a mask and everybody was frantically looking for so they just to come up with a very creative solution but now we have a plant of the mask so what is the popularity of this sunny mask at this current moment thank you i think that uh I, even back in the summer i don't know current moment dr studinger said they're still available on etsy but i think that nemotech was able to sell a a few hundred of them. I think that might be an overestimate, but they they sold a few of them to uh, a few businesses locally, and then even to the hospitals. I think Freeman bought a bunch of them here in Joplin. A couple of comments, real quick. Um, in addition to shop towels, they've suggested you could use those HEPA filtered vacuum bags, and I've tried it. You can just cut those up and put that on there. I mean, that's pretty cool. The other thing is, in in the case of the next pandemic and and likely shortage of PPE. These masks could be used in industrial applications to free up KN95 for medical workers. And that, that was part of the thinking too, for like food, industrial applications like that. Now, Ann, Ann Pham has a question in the chat and she said, the only reusable mask I've heard in the past was developed in Korea and has yet to be available internationally. Have you been, tried testing prop Propylene sanita sanitization with UV light. Dr. Stoddinger, maybe you know more about that. I think that we had talked about it. I know we that they about it. sanitizing with you know the regular KN95s, yeah. but we didn't do it with with these. No, we didn't do it, but we could. Polypropylene mm -hmm. is not stable for UV light or gamma radiation, so it cannot be sterilized by both. Actually, there was a study from NASA try to see polypropylene if, it's, if it, it can stand radiation, gamma radiation, did not <laughs> fare well. Same thing with UV, UV make it really brittle. So this elasticity goes away. I know when my students leave the pipette in, in the tissue culture hood with the UV light on, it's not very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, uh, disintegrates the chemical comp uh, composition yeah. of the polypropylene. Yeah. yeah, we proved that experimentally, no question. <laughs> Is it Dr. Sarsar? Did you have a question or was that just the comment? Uh, just, just the comment that, uh, you know, unfortunately, propofluorine is, is not, it's not gamma uh, radiated stable. So uh, you cannot sterilize it because there's a lot of things you can actually sterilize with, with radiation. Uh, unfortunately, that one of them is, is not uh, fully propofluorine. And, and actually we tested with a cesium source and, and it becomes so brittle, like it, it's like went into like a dust. I think even this one from sitting for forever, it kind of just, it breaks. But I think that's the issue with the, the single wall design is just yeah. that they're kind of flimsy. They're, you know, you can wash them, reuse them, but you know, how long they last, they probably need to work but, on that. But, but it's a clever, you know, application that, you, you know, you can use soap, clean it, use it. It's for emergency and, and, and situation like this, it's great. Dr. Wolf? Dr. Wolf, you're muted. 
wrong button here. I, that that regarding the shop towels that actually came out in a publication. There were some uh, women in a dress shop that were shocked at what people were trying to use to make masks. So they ran out to Granger and got a particle generator, and they took every bit of uh, text that they could or uh, of material that they could find things to look at. And they concluded that shop towels from specific brands were in fact among the best things that you could still breathe through, but, but actually excluded the various particle sizes. And then other people did things where you know, people were wearing that thing around there, you know, that they would just pull it up over their mouth, that little thin layer. Of st and that was shown to actually uh, increase the thing or increase the risk of infection of others because you aerosolize the stuff. It did not capture. So there, there actually was a little bit of data around that. But I was going to ask Karsten, um, you know, the, the single wall didn't have pores big enough for bacteria, but viruses are smaller than bacteria. Are you concerned about that? Uh, potentially, you know, that's one of the questions that I thought might arise, you know, because of the size difference between, you know, the coronavirus, which is a tiny mRNA virus and E. coli, which is, you know, massive in comparison. I think the idea of the autoclave is good. You know, who knows after multiple autoclaves whether or not a virus would survive in that, but definitely something that would need to be studied more. I have concerns with it, but you know, I'm not sure how we would go more in depth with that. Dr. Ford? Um, I think you kind of answered my question a little bit. So I was just curious, you did all of these cleanings where your readout is bacteria, but presumably if the virus doesn't get through, it might still be on the plastic as well. Mm -hmm. So how can you apply your results to look at viruses, not just bacteria? That's a good question. You know, uh, maybe figuring out a way to quantify the amount of virus that, that lives on it and specifically, you know, the size of, of the space between, I think what they said is printed without in, infill. So the somehow figure out the size of space between each of the the go arounds of the plastic or whatever but you know that's something that definitely would need need more research that's beyond the infrastructure of what we have in Joppa. yeah <laughs> I, I just i just want to point out one thing about viruses viruses are really really weak they are even weaker than bacteria uh, now they transmit easy and, and all of that because of the particle size but any virus you can kill with actually 30% alcohol. They are really weak. Uh, outside of biological matter, viruses basically dust that don't do anything. Uh, that's, that's, that's something about viruses. You know, most of the viruses, I don't know about some, some engineered viruses, that's a different thing, but, but the viruses are really weak when they are not in a biological matter. And any, any soap will, will kill them. Well, the concern, though, was was that there was, you know, on stainless steel, there were certain surfaces where they persisted, supposedly this one persisted for an extended period of time. So I, I'm not sure I agree with what you're saying, but I'm not not sure that it's it's always true to the extent, perhaps. The best research raises a lot of questions. <laughs>